I called editor friends of mine and I called Joanne Fogel, who had cut the pilot of L.A. Law. And I uh, said, what's happening? Is there any work? Can I get it? Can I blah, 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 blah? How can I work again? And she said, you should call Greg Hoblet because they're having trouble making their schedules. They've got a couple editors there that are not TV editors, and, and he knows you, and I think you should give him a call. So I called the line producer, who was at that time Ellen Pressman, and I said, Ellen, what's happening? <laughs> and uh, she said, could you be here on Thursday at 3 o'clock? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, fuck. I, I wasn't thinking I would go back quite so. So I go for this interview on Thursday at 3. They give me one episode to cut, uh, and then no guarantee. And it happened to be an episode that starred Jimmy Smits. And um, I had never seen anybody as handsome and attractive as Jimmy Smith. And so I, I went to the editing room with all the three editors, and they are like in bunker mentality. They're so under the gun. They're, they're, they've got circles under their eyes. Their schedules are terrible. They're all freaked out. And thankfully, they put me in a different building. They just put me in my own little room to cut my own little episode. And so I didn't have to sort of uh, absorb the energy that was in that editing room. And I cut this episode, and I immediately fell in love with Jimmy Smits. And I maintained my crush on Jimmy Smits for eight years, or actually more, because then I, I directed him in NYPD Blue as well. Um, but uh, And it was this funny story about dog biting, and um, it went well. They were relieved, and uh, uh, so they released one of the editors that they had and hired me, and uh, I was there from the eighth show of the first year in one capacity or another until the end of the show, eight years later. I took a break to have my second kid, but was very quickly back into the routine of working on that show. They viewed themselves as progressive people. They would hire two women every single year. And, and I don't know whether this still happens. I bet it does. But while I was sitting in those meetings, they would say, OK, here's the list of our favorite directors. They were all men. And here's the women. Who are we going to pick? of these women. And then they would hire two. They would hire them for two episodes a year. And then they would overproduce them in the first episode so that the women got unsure of themselves. And uh, the episode would come out fine because they had overproduced them. They controlled it a lot. So this was a total of four episodes out of 22. Was that the run then? Each a woman would get two out of 22. Uh, and Got then it. they would hire two women, so there okay. would be a total of four. Yes, okay. correct. They'd overproduce them the first time around, and then they would abandon them the second time around. So they, so they, so they sort of cut the legs out from underneath them the first time, and then abandoned them to their own devices the second time, and they failed. And I saw it happen over and over and over again. And um, it, it, and I don't, I truly believe they didn't know they were doing it. I truly believe that. I don't, I don't blame them. I'm just saying this is what I observed. And so we get to this point where I am now kind of overseeing the editing because I'd had my second child and I didn't really want to be there the whole time. And, um, and I go to lunch with Rick Wallace and uh, we shoot the bowl as we were inclined to do. We were really good friends. And uh, eventually he says, OK, here's the point of this meeting. And I said, OK. And he said, every guy and his brother, including the drivers, come into my office and ask me to direct an episode. Why don't you? And I said, well, 
There was another editor who was really chomping at the bit, and I didn't want to get in there. And it had been now 15 years since I had shot anything, and I was good at what I was doing, and I was kind of afraid to do that. And um, he said, well, you have to decide whether you want to expand your life or not, because out of all the people in my landscape, you're the person I would take a flyer on. And I was like, can I have a recording of this conversation, please? This is like not to be believed. Um, and Wallace was one of the showrunners then, right? Is that right? Yeah, Rick, okay, Rick Wallace it. was running L.A. Law. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, so at the end of that conversation, we agreed that I would direct two episodes the following year. And then about three months later, at the rap party, he came up to me and he said, I have an alternate proposal. And I said, what's that? And he said, I want you to help me produce the show. I need help and I want you to be a producer. And I said, what does that do to the directing deal? And he said, well, you'd be kind of busy. And I said, I won't do it without that because the only reason I would produce is to direct. And so we compromised and we agreed that I would do one that following year and I would produce the whole year. And then I also said, look, I get it that you want help in the editing room. Um, I'll do that. But for me to have this work for me, I need to spend time on the stage. That's what I don't know. And I will, I will do what you need me to do in the editing room, but I need that. So uh, the next, the following year, Michael Robin, now mogul emeritus, and I, he was 23, I was 40. Uh, we both became producers on the show, and we traded off shows, and each of us spent the entire episode on the stage with the director that was our episode and, and rotated all the way through the year. And at the end, I directed my first on the 21st episode or something like that. And that went well enough that um, they empowered me to keep going. And by the time I finished that show, I shot 20 of them. And um, they really gave me the opportunity to grow into and become a director.